starting because I messed up earlier. Okay. Hey, so it is Monday, April 3rd, and we're starting a new unit looking at the history of North America and when people came here and how they got here and how we started settling this land, what different groups of people came and what happened when different cultures clashed. So we've kind of looked at that through some of our social studies materials, but Beaverton District is trying to sort of redo uh, our social studies materials and make them a little more current and make them represent more people. So uh, today I want you thinking about what you know about where people came from who first came to this part of the world, why they came here, who came, and then what happened when the different groups sort of bumped into each other. So for that, I'm gonna show you that today's lesson is taken from a slideshow that Beaverton put together. And here's our slideshow, but first I'll show you if you go into social studies and you go into the modules, you'll see there's this kind of weird one called Beaverton District New Social Studies Mod 2. And it has five activities in it. One, how and when did the first Americans arrive? Two, exploration and colonization. What does that mean to colonize another place? Three, the revolution. How did that affect our country? Four, perspectives in early US history. And finally, five, US territory today. We talk about the United States, but actually in our class alone, we have kids from, I think, three different territories. Um, and what is a territory? We have Kainoa's family who comes from Hawaii, which really was an independent nation that the United States went over, took over, and believe it or not, put their queen into um, house arrest in her own palace, Queen Liliuokalani in Hawaii. And we kept her in house arrest for a long time, like two years, and took over the country and then turned it into the 50th state, right? So um, that was not a very nice thing to do. We have tried to take over Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico has an interesting relationship with us now. Um, Guam, so America and Samoa, all these places that you hear about that have a relationship with the U.S., what is that relationship? So we're going to be looking at these activities. Starting on April 4th, you'll see our first thing is due, which is tomorrow, all the way to April 20th. And most of these um, you don't actually need to submit for other than to tell me that you attended class if you came to class. So let's click on this first activity number one. How and when did Americans first arrive? And here it is. And it says, share this slide deck. So here's our slide deck. And it starts with this story of um, Native people and how they explain how people arrived on the back of a giant turtle. So let's watch this. If it will play, which it was playing a minute ago. Come on. Oh, well, I've heard that story before. Have you? Well, we're going to hear yeah. it. It's like the ride. It's weird because they're like riding on a turtle. Can you guys hear it okay? Can you hear yep. it? Okay. Snifrati, Saninga Tonya, Craig Go was an honey of Hito, the Yohati, a Tony Gonyak. Tanyo <laughs> Sunday, Scanondi, 
Sky Woman, our grandmother as we know her, gave birth to a daughter, the mother of Kodino Sony life as we know it today. So that is one creation story for how some people feel that people came to this part of the world. Um, but we have many theories. Oops, I forgot to make it small screen. There we go. That's what I meant to do. And the next resource here is um, another one that I think I opened up. Yeah, here we go. How the first Americans arrived. Let's watch this one for another theory of how they arrived. This is about five minutes long. John Erlison believes the first Americans came by boat as early as 16,000 years ago. I can't hear it. Can't hear it? While the last... Can other people hear it? Some people can hear it? Liam, do you just need I to get hear it? fine. Okay. I hear I don't know why you can't hear it, Liam. Check your... And at that time was still blocked by ice. The I, coast it's of like, the Pacific Northwest was mostly ice-free. It was possible to find a route south, bypassing any icebergs and living from the bounty of the sea. One of the reasons the coastal route is so attractive is this stuff. This is bull kelp. In one form or another, kelp forests extended all around the Pacific Rim. These kelp forests are super productive. They put out billions of spores. They can grow as much as a meter a day. And they ultimately support very complex food webs, fish, shellfish, marine mammals. And ultimately, it's edible and quite tasty. <laughs> Pretty good, actually. Rather than walking through an ice-free corridor, the very first Americans could have paddled down a kelp highway. There are kelp forests along the Pacific coast, from North to South America, all the way to Patagonia. Traveling down the kelp highway would have been quicker and easier than coming over land always going through the same terrain, always at sea level. Anthropological theory suggested that people didn't start really fishing and develop boats until 10,000 years ago. It, it was always inexplicable to me. The coastlines are so productive, why would humans ignore them for 99% of history? I still think people may have come down the ice-free corridor. I just think at this point, it's more likely they came down the coast earlier and that the very first Americans were coastally adapted. Any archeological evidence for a coastal migration has been washed away by the rising seas. But according to this theory, the Pacific seaboard was dotted with makeshift camps. People would have moved from headland to headland, catching fish and marine mammals and harvesting kelp. Then they would move on, always hugging the coast, staying in sight of land. It must have been a truly amazing journey to come down the coast and explore these places where humans had never been before. These seafarers may then have headed inland, following any large river they came across. In this way, they could have navigated into the heart of the continent. For people moving down the coast, these rivers would have been like detours on the Kelp Highway. They would have provided all the resources that coastal peoples needed to explore deep into the interior 
and ultimately colonize all of North America. The U.S. river system provides a potential map of their journey. If they came inland along the Columbia River, they could have joined up with the Missouri, which flows into the Mississippi, and finally into the Gulf of Mexico. In this way, people like Eva could have crossed the continent long before the ice-free corridor. But if people came along the coast, and then the rivers, where are their remains? Who were they? And what became of them? <laughs> so that is another uh, theory. Um, the one that is most common is the one that they say that people came on the Bering Land Bridge. Somehow my screens got reversed. Let me switch them back. Um, which is the one up by Alaska, and it's kind of what we studied earlier this year. Um, let me stop my share. Maybe that'll help. Come on, you. Stop share. There. Um, so that's one of the major theories of how people came to this area. It's the one that I learned, you know, like this is it. But, you know, the truth is it happened long ago, and nobody really knows for sure when and where the first people came from. So one of the things you need to think about is, what am I going to believe? Where am I going to get my information? And, and what will I believe about this? And, you know, people have different beliefs. It, it is true that some people believe in the turtle creation myth. Some people believe in other stories. So you have to think about what you believe. Let's see what the next slide has for us. If I can find the next slide. Where is it? There it is. Come on, you. There it is. All right, so the next thing is, um, well, I don't know what this is actually. Until 20 years oh, ago, the prevailing theory for how the earliest human settlers arrived in America came down to one thing, big game. It was thought that humans followed megafauna, such as mammoths and bison across the Bering Strait and through an ice-free corridor down into North America around 13,500 years ago. These early humans, the Clovis, left behind spear points with telltale grooves, evidence of their big game hunts. But this theory collapsed when evidence of human occupation dating to 14,500 years ago was found at the Monte Verde site in Chile, a thousand years before Clovis points appear in North America. This gave rise to a new theory, that humans may have traveled by boat, starting in Beringia and sailing down the coast some 16,000 years ago. Since the discovery at Monte Verde, researchers have turned their attention to the Pacific coast in search of early sites. Cedros Island is practically brimming with archaeological evidence for an early American culture that had mastered coastal environments. Stone tools and clamshells found at several sites on the island were radiocarbon dated to between 11,000 and 13,000 years ago. Not quite pre-Clovis, but getting there. In the hunt for evidence of these early settlers, researchers have been searching not only on land, but also under the sea. As the ice sheets covering North America began to melt around 16,500 years ago, the sea level rose 120 meters, likely swamping any early settlements along the Pacific coast. To uncover these drowned settlements, researchers tried to deduce the location of these settlers' most important resource, fresh water. They started mapping the ocean floor off the coasts of Oregon and California in search of evidence of ancient riverbanks and estuaries. By taking core samples of the ocean floor where these riverbanks lie, researchers hope to understand these lost environments and perhaps even eventually find evidence of early human occupation. As the glaciers melted and sea levels rose, parts of the coasts of British Columbia and southwestern Alaska rose as well, no longer bearing the weight of the massive sheets of ice. The consequences of this geological quirk can be found on Calvert Island, where the sea level rise was as little as two meters, leaving easily accessible evidence of coastal settlements. Here researchers found 29 footprints preserved in clay, buried underneath a half a meter of soil. 
A piece of wood embedded in one of the footprints allowed them to date the footprints to just over 13,000 years ago. More evidence has been found on nearby coastal islands. 12,700 year old spear points left over from a bear hunt and 14,000 year old stone tools left next to a hearth. Clues that the first Americans made their way down the coast by boat continue to present themselves, but archaeologists aren't ready to confirm the theory just yet. A string of well-documented sites along the coasts of southwestern Alaska and British Columbia, dating back to at least 15,000 years ago, and extending through time down the coast, will be needed to truly prove the coastal migration theory. Until then, archaeologists in both North and South America will continue the hunt for signs that the earliest Americans were, indeed, a seafaring people. Very cool, you guys. This is like a whole new thing from what I was taught. So I was taught, you know, this is where people came from. They came across the Bering Land Bridge, and that's how our ancestors got here. But this is a new theory on how people uh, explored by sea. Very interesting. Let's see what else we've got today. Of course, I forgot to close it. <laughs> All right. So Broken Bones Could Rewrite History of Humans in America. So this is a huge article about another theory about how Stone Age hunters got here. For many years, the scientific story of how the first humans came to the Americas said that small groups of Stone Age hunters walked across a land bridge between eastern Siberia and western Alaska 13,000 years ago, making their way down an ice-free inland corridor into the heart of North America, chasing bison, woolly mammoths, which we've actually found bones of in Oregon, and other large mammals. These ancestors of today's Native Americans established a thriving culture that eventually spread across two continents to the tip of South America. So now we're saying we're not quite sure if that's exactly right. In recent years, however, this theory has been challenged because of archaeological sites in North and South America showing that humans were here one to 2,000 years before the first migration. The new theory, known as the Kelp Highway, dates people back to 14 to 15,000 years ago. Amazing. Other evidence suggests that humans may have arrived in North America at least 20,000 years ago. So when we're talking about um, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, you know, we're talking about 600 years ago instead of uh, 15 to 20,000 years. So we're talking about 15,000 years of Native American settlement of this region. It seems a little silly to teach so much about the last few hundred years, doesn't it? Other evidence suggests that humans may have arrived at least 20,000 years ago. Much of this new ideas are not driven by archaeologists, but by DNA samples. So as science changes, it changes our facts, which is very interesting. One of the key flaws of the original Bering Land Bridge theory was its bias toward the inland rather than marine route. On the coast, people would have had lots of food and they wouldn't have needed to worry. Um, so they're talking about all this archaeology they're doing up on those islands off of Alaska and British Columbia. Today, the coast of Pacific Northwest is very different than the one the first Americans would have encountered. Their lushly forested shoreline would have been bare rock following the retreat of the ice sheets. In the last 15 to 20,000 years, sea levels have risen 400 feet. So anything that was like all the settlements and things are now underwater. The vast ice sheets have begun to melt and the, and the sea has risen. Uh, it happened so rapidly that they would have been noticeable on an almost year-to-year -year basis when it first started. Early people moving south along the Pacific coast would have used the Columbia River to walk and paddle into North America, making it the first route inland into North America for migrating humans. And this is kind of our big question at the end of today. If you didn't come to class, I asked you to answer, why is the Columbia River and Oregon important to the history of people in North America? And it's because now they believe that might have been how people got into other parts of North America was by the Columbia River. Once in the New World, the first Americans, probably numbering in the hundreds or few thousands, split up into two groups, a northern and southern branch. The Northern Branch was in Alaska and Canada, and they still are today. There are many native people up there. And the others moved down through Central America and South America. 
Such a movement could account for a growing number of archaeological sites dating from 14 to 15,000 years ago in Oregon, Wisconsin, Texas, and Florida. Has anybody ever been to Summer Lake? There's a place near Bend called Summer Lake. You've been there, I know it. And it has a cave where they found a sandal that I think is 15,000 years old. It's amazing. You can't see the sandal. They put it in a museum. As scientists debate how people came to the Americas, it's worth noting there could be more than one right answer. So I'm going to stop our share and just show you, well, I'm not going to stop our share. I'm going to show you the assignment and what it asked you to do today, but you don't have to do it because you guys came to class. So today's, oops, today's assignment, here it is. Write a brief response to this question. What special role do Oregon and the Columbia River play in terms of understanding the first Americans? You guys don't have to do that assignment, but if you could go down and um, open this one, it's activity one in social studies. So go to social studies and just say, I attended class. That's all you have to do so that I can give you 10 points for coming to class. And like I say, all five of these activities, if you come to class, you don't actually have to do anything other than just kind of watch the videos and come. So here it is. So I don't have to do anything? You have to go on to the assignment, activity one, and you have to submit something that says, I came to class, Ms. Laws. You don't have to say Ms. Laws, but you know. Okay. Or you can say something like a uh, super cool new theory or when I grow up, I think I'll kayak the Pacific coast from Alaska to South America, eating kelp. There you go. You can say one of those things to me and submit it, okay? So just submit something saying that you're here and I can give you your 10 points. If you don't submit anything, I can't give you the points. So, alrighty, and tomorrow we'll talk about the next phase of North American history.